Hey, let's talk the J10. So, since the J10 is expected to cover a multi role spot, it has been integrated with several Chinese weapons. Overall, it has a rather complete panoply of weapons available either air to air or air to ground. However, we have to consider that the Chinese still use a good percentage of unguided weapons, like the Russians, of which the aircraft can carry about 5600 kilos. But I'm running ahead of me. Let's start from the beginning. This is the third episode of the series about the J-10 and if you want to start from number one, link above and below. The J-10 features a classic gun. It uses a Gryazov Shipunov GSH-23 dual-barrel Russian cannon, a model that is in use on several aircraft, mainly of Russian or Chinese origin, around the world. It is a 23mm weapon with a rate of fire of about 3400 rounds per second and a muzzle velocity of 715 meters per second. And no, the dual barrel configuration is not just an additional barrel, it's a specific technology. In fact, the recoil of one barrel actually chambers the other barrel and sets it ready for fire. The weapon doesn't need any electrical actuation to start the firing cycle. It is entirely mechanical and very, very reliable. It's true, it has half the rate of the American Gatlings, but it starts the firing cycle faster. The round is heavier and with more exploded mass. This cannon is not new at all. It was designed in the 60s, but it is still in use. We have to say that the fuse of the rounds that were fired by the first series of the weapon were not really uh, reliable, but that problem is long gone. Chinese air-to-air weapons in these days are quite famous and quite widely covered, but still, we want to give our take. And mind, we are using the J10C, the most recent variant, as our reference variant. So the C variant is integrated with the PL-8 and the PL-10 short-range infrared missiles. PL-8 is basically the standard Chinese air-to-air weapon. It has been in service since 1988 and it is a derivation of the Israeli Python. The PL-10 is an entirely Chinese weapon. It is not clear when it enters service, but it seems to be a great improvement upon the PL-8. It is slightly larger than the PL-8. It features a mix of thrust vectoring and aerodynamic controls, allowing the weapon to pull a very high Gs. And the seeker is an infrared imaging seeker that is actually capable of swinging plus or minus 90 degrees. Uh, that is, the entire frontal hemisphere is covered by this sensor. The sensor is slaved to the helmet-mounted sight, and so the pilot can designate a target just by looking at it. The maximum range is declared to be 20 kilometers. Coming to medium range, the aircraft is integrated with the PL-12 Active Radar Homing Missile. This is basically the standard medium range air-to-air -air weapon for the Chinese Air Force and the Chinese Navy. Analysts consider it to be perfectly equivalent to the American Amram or the Russian R-77. As often happens with Chinese creations, we know very little about this weapon. We know it uses the same data link as the R-77. R-77, we know that a particular care has been placed on the home jam modes and the maximum range is declared to be about 100 kilometers. Uh, mind, when we talk about missile ranges, we should always exert caution because the declared range is usually the maximum ballistic range for the missile, and even that may not also be true. The actual distance at 
to which a missile can reach a target is extremely variable. It depends from the relative speeds between the launcher and the target. And also extremely important is the relative direction between the two. If they are approaching head-on, the missile range is actually maximized. But if one is chasing the other, the range could be easily 10%, 15% of the maximum declared range. So don't take these numbers too seriously. It entered service around 2005 and since then it has been seen basically on all the main Chinese platforms. In 2016 though, a new weapon appeared on the pictures being leaked from behind the Great Firewall. The PL-15 is a bigger weapon than the PL-12, albeit the general configuration and the guidance systems are similar. The analysts believe that the size is actually an indication of a very long range. Some sources actually actually estimate that the ballistic range in ideal condition could reach 300 kilometers. That would make the PL-15 the longest range weapon in service today. The weapon features an AESA radar and a dual thrust rocket motor and Western analysts believe that it has been developed mainly to attack high value assets like OAX or tankers. Should I say OAXs? Chinese air-to-ground weaponry is less known, but is definitely worth consideration. So air-to-air -air is an area where China is believed to have reached substantial parity with the West, but air-to-ground weaponry is less known. So as we said before, the aircraft is still often seen with iron bombs and unguided rockets. The latter in particular seem to be object of quite a lot of attention during training. We have to remember that the Air Force in China is actually a branch of the army. Till the end of the 20th century, air-to-air -air was sort of an afterthought, or well, maybe it was definitely given less consideration than air-to-ground. Missions like close air support or ground attack were considered the real priority. So a lot of attention was given and is still given to the, those kind of weapons that can deliver a large amount of firepower on the ground. And in the case of China, for a large amount, we are probably still talking about low technology slash unguided. However, this is changing in China too. So the Chinese have created a series of families of weapons that fill similar roles as Western weapons. Okay, let's start. One of the most common Chinese guided weapons are the bomb kits of the LTPGB family. These systems have a close resemblance with the American Paveway. In fact, the first generation was derived by captured Paveway 1 laser designation pods captured by the Vietnamese during the Vietnam War. The first generation was actually a cheap copy and was not considered adequate, so it never entered service. But the following generation, the LT2, actually did enter service because it was a cheap, reliable and effective weapon that is still in use today. And it is probably the most common of all the Chinese guided weapons. There is a third generation, which is the LT3, which is not a copy, but is definitely similar in design to the American Paveway 3, but is seen in smaller numbers because apparently it is more expensive and complex than the simple LT2. Together with the laser-guided LT family, I think you will not be surprised to learn that exists a inertial and GPS guided family, the FT family, that is sort of equivalent to the American JDAMs. There is a legend on the internet that even this one was actually copied uh, from the JDAM, but no, the inertial technology and the GPS technology are pretty much commonplace. They can be easily derived from civilian applications, so there was no need to copy a different weapon just to develop this. 
having this kind of guidance is just a good idea and it was within uh, reach of a number of countries for example France has a similar family of weapons it is quite ironic that the weapon can use obviously the Chinese Beidou system but also the American GPNS and the Russian GLONASS Yes, because the casual observer may not know that the most used uh, positioning system in the world is not the American GPS. There are at least three others. There is the European Galileo, which is actually a civilian service, the Russian GLONASS, and the Chinese Beidou, which is considered to be the most precise. The Beidou system had sort of a rough start. The Chinese had to go through three iterations, but in 2020, the constellation of 55 satellites has been completed and pretty much the whole of the globe is now covered by this system. I wouldn't be surprised if the phone that I'm using to record this is actually calculating its position using Beidou rather than GPS. And for those who are surprised that a weapon can use more than one system, even potentially opponent systems, well, this is a technology that is commonplace. Most civilian receivers use more than one system. More modern than LT and FT families, there is the LS family. And in particular, the aircraft has been seen with the LS-6 gliding bomb. So the LS-6 is basically just another family of kits that can be installed on an iron bomb. It comes as a normal kit or as a gliding kit. And the gliding kit is such that with an ideal release at high speed and high altitude, it can reach above 60 kilometers of distance, which makes the weapon sort of a standoff weapon. The peculiarity of the LS family is that it combines the LT and FT guidance systems in just one package. So it can be laser guided, it can use the inertial guidance, or it can use a positioning system to direct itself toward the target. Obviously the advantage is that the weapon can attack either moving targets or fixed targets in the first case, it will require laser designation and guidance. In the second case, it will use the inertial guidance or GPS. Apparently, they're also developing an infrared guided version, so they're investing big time on this family. The KD-88 is generally considered an equivalent of the American SLAM, but in pure Russian style it is more a family of systems. Yes, the Chinese definitely appear to be quite fond of this concept of a family of systems. The missile uses a small turbofan engine and it has a range that is estimated to be about 230 kilometers. The total weight is 670 kilos with a warhead of about 285 kilos, a semi-armor piercing, which is respectable. In the KD-88 family, there are two versions currently in service, one with television guidance and the other with infrared guidance. When the missile is launched, it uses inertial guidance, but it also has a data link that can be used for mid-course correction, but it also transmits back to the launching aircraft the images that are captured by the sensor. Terminal guidance can be completely automatic according to the parameters set before the launch, or it can still be executed by a human, which can choose the target at the very last second, giving the weapon a good flexibility. However, a drawback of this missile is the fact that the launching aircraft must carry a relatively bulky external communications pod guide the weapon. The J-10 has been seen carrying two KD-88. And since the Chinese love this concept of weapon families, uh, there are news of a radar guided variant and suppression of, of our defense variants, so a radar homing variant currently in development. The YJ-91 is another typical Chinese story, because at first sight it may seem another copy of a Russian weapon, the KH-31, but in truth it is not. 
Yes, the KH-31 is produced in China under an official license. The YJ-91 features substantial differences. In fact, the Chinese use it as a radar homing missile with a range of about 100 km and a speed of Mach 3. It weighs 600 kilos with an 87 kilos warhead. So while general design, structures and propulsion are pretty much the same as the KH-31, the seeker and the warhead are totally different. First of all, it is one seeker and not several seekers as in the original KH-31, but still it has a multi-band capability, so it's capable of addressing several types of different radars. Well, I realize that addressing in this case is sort of a euphemism. The YJ-91 is less dependent than the original KH-31 to the aircraft ECM because with this seeker it can detect and designate its own targets. From the same missile, the Chinese then developed in-house an anti-ship version. This version seems to be capable of terminal randomized maneuvering and considering that the speed of the weapon is about Mach 3, a missile like this is more than a match for many point defense systems. So as you can see in terms of armament and weaponry the J-10C seems to be perfectly aligned with other fighters of its own generation. And if you want to understand which are these other fighters that the J-10 is up against, I would suggest you to watch part one of this series that is going to appear beside me, together with some other interesting videos about China and the Chinese Air Force. So, thank you very much for watching and see you there.